Okay. So mushroom cultivation, um, it might seem kind of scary, but it, it's super easy and straightforward. And you can see um, a lot of the pictures in here are going to be pictures that I took. Uh, some of them are not, but like this picture here on the front page, these are mushrooms that I grow in my own backyard with my uh, wonderful assistant here. So it's a, it's a very easy process. But to understand mushroom cultivation, one of the first things that you need to understand is like, what is a mushroom? Because if you want to know how to grow something, you have to understand how it works, what it is and how it interacts with the environment. So, you know, what, what exactly is a mushroom? Is it a plant? Is it like growing, you know, tomatoes? It's, it's not. It's a very different kind of organism and it needs different things to grow and to thrive and survive. So mushrooms are a member of the kingdom fungi. And kingdom means that they are their own uh, phylogenetic uh, biological group very separate from other organisms. We have a kingdom for animals, a kingdom for plants, kingdoms for all kinds of little microbial stuff that we don't usually see, but we also have a kingdom for fungi. And they are very separate from plants. They are not like plants at all. Although at one point, early botanists and taxonomists did think that mushrooms were types of plants. And you'll see that referenced in very old botanical or taxonomic textbooks, but they're not. They're their own kingdom doing their own thing and they have their own unique requirements. A uh, fun fact is that even though we are all very distantly related, that the kingdom fungi is more closely related to the kingdom animalia where, where humans are located than they are to plants. So you actually have more in common with the mushrooms on your pizza than you do with the tomatoes. But in all honesty, you don't have much in common with either one. So like mushrooms, they are decomposers. They feed on material. They don't make their own food like plants do. They require a food source. They can't make their own. And when you think about mushrooms, probably one of the easiest ways to think about this is to think of a fungus as being like an apple tree. When we say fungus, we mean the body of the organism, the true organism itself, which for fungi exists as this white filamentous stuff called hyphae. And hyphae is the actual body of the fungal organism, the living, thriving part of the organism that feeds and takes up nutrients and helps the organism grow. And so you can think about it as being like an apple tree, whereas the mushroom, the part of the fungus that we actually see, you can think of as being an analogy to the apple fruit itself. It's the part of the organism that that organism uses to, uh, to spread and propagate itself and make more apple trees or, or mushrooms, whatever the case might be. So you can think of a mushroom as being analogous to a sort of fruit or vegetable. It's the reproductive structure of that organism. And then the spores that mushrooms spread around are like the seeds from, from your apple trees. They are how that reproductive material, that genetic material is spread to create more uh, mushrooms someplace else. And this is important baseline information to have when you start thinking about mushroom cultivation, because if you want to cultivate mushrooms successfully at home, you need to understand a little bit about how, what they're doing in the environment, how they're living and what they need. So think about mushrooms as being nature's cleaning crew. The majority of macro fungi, meaning fungi that we can see, because there are thousands and thousands of species of fungi out there that we cannot see that are microscopic, right? But the micro macro fungi, the ones that we can see, uh, they are mostly something called saprophytes. And saprophytes mean that they feed on dead and decaying material. So you can think of them as nature's cleaning crew, the garbage men of the natural world. They're out there cleaning up the messes, breaking everything down as they search for food and consuming nutrients from what they're decomposing. And that is how they, they grow and thrive. And a very important part of what they're doing from an ecological sense in the environment, breaking down that organic matter. And this is important when you think about the food source for your mushrooms. They're mostly saprophytes, the mushrooms that we cultivate and grow. They're saprophytic fungi that feed on this dead and decaying material. So you want to be sure to give them the right kind of food source, which we'll talk about more here in just a moment. So when you think about fungal cultivation, uh, keep in mind that these saprophytes are some of the easiest mushrooms to cultivate. Uh, there are several species of fungi out there that people very much would like to cultivate. You know, um, morels, truffles, and chanterelles are three that come immediately to mind. There's fungi called mycorrhizal fungi, and they are far more challenging to cultivate and not beginner friendly or really even part home cultivation friendly, although truffle cultivation is coming further and further every year. 
Uh, but mycorrhizal fungi, they exist in a symbiotic relationship with a plant species. So they're not saprophytes. They don't feed on that dead and decaying matter. They need a relationship with a living plant host in order to survive and thrive and grow. And that makes them much more challenging and tricky to cultivate because you're not just dealing with a mushroom or a fungus at that point. You're dealing with that symbiotic relationship between these two organisms, which is much trickier. But the majority of mushrooms that... Uh, beginning cultivation enthusiasts are interested in growing are these saprophytic fungi, which are far easier to deal with. Uh, yeah, mycorrhizal fungi, like we were talking about, they rely on this plant symbiont uh, and these fungi are recruited by different plants. And there's a lot of tricky components to the ecology and biology between the interaction of those species that makes them very challenging to, uh, to grow and to cultivate in a, in a controlled setting. Saprophytes, meanwhile, are much easier. They feed on dead and decaying matter, uh, logs, stump straw, and they have a lot of flexibility generally in the food that they'll eat. They're not super picky eaters. They're kind of more like the, the kid that'll eat everything instead of the one who doesn't want to eat any of their veggies. So a little bit of background really quick on mushroom cultivation in the US. This is not a new thing by any means. Uh, people have been cultivating mushrooms for thousands of years and in Asia, in Europe, and across the globe. People have cultivated mushrooms for a very long time. However, in the US, the first large scale mushroom cultivation enterprise uh, took place in Pennsylvania. And this is where people employed the natural cave system in the area to uh, provide environmental or uh, temperature regulation to grow these mushrooms. You know, mushrooms love humidity and moisture and cooler temperatures. And this cave systems in Pennsylvania provided that for them. These are the little button mushrooms like you get in the grocery store. And today in the US, Pennsylvania is still the largest producer of these button mushrooms, although they don't grow them in caves anymore. They have more climate control controlled conditions. Uh, but these button mushrooms were the first large scale mushroom cultivation enterprise here in, in the US uh, through this, this cave system where they would grow them on manure and soil casings. All right, so getting into you know, like what we really want to talk about here today, which is I want to grow mushrooms at home. How do I do it? There are four very important considerations, primary considerations when you want to grow fungi, and we're going to cover all of those today. Uh, and the first one that you want to think about is the substrate. The substrate means the substance that you're going to be growing your mushrooms on, the food source for those mushrooms. So most of the mushrooms that we're interested in cult culturing are going to be saprophytes, feeding on that dead and decaying matter. And that means that they are usually more flexible in their food source. Uh, these are just a few examples of some of the substrates that people will commonly use to grow um, some of these mushroom species. Hardwood pellets are a good choice. Uh, and some people will use these hardwood sawdust pellets like you would use for a pellet stove to grow mushrooms. And this can be great. Uh, there are some cautions here. You don't want to use any kind of pellets that have con coniferous species in them. So no pines, no other species like that, uh, only hardwood trees. And you want to be sure that it's purely hardwood, nothing like broken down pallets or other refuse wood material in there that could have been treated with chemicals at some point or have other crummy stuff going on with it. Because ultimately you're hoping to eat these mushrooms. So you don't want their food source to have a lot of toxins or other harsh chemicals in that food source that you might later inadvertently consume. Uh, so yeah, pellets and uh, sawdust, hardwood sawdust are a great choice for mushroom cultivation. And part of what makes the pellets a great choice is that they don't have any moisture, very little moisture and then they're hard pelletized. They don't tend to have a lot of contaminants, other bacteria and fungi in them that might comp compete with the mushrooms that you're trying to grow for available, available real estate in that substrate. Logs are also very popular. This isn't as accessible to people who might live in urban areas or people with space restrictions, but especially for shiitake and oyster mushroom cultivation, and we'll talk about both of those specifically later on, uh, log cultivation is a very popular option for people who have access to a woodlot and access to their own logs. So a very long time of, of growing these mushroom species on logs, a long history of that uh, for some of these species. 
Straw is also a great choice. And this is actually what I use the most often in my home cultivation is I just use plain old straw, not hay, it's too much nutrients in hay, uh, but just plain old straw. It's easy to pasteurize or sterilize, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And it's a really nice food source, especially for oyster mushrooms. This is a great starting material when you get into growing your own mushrooms at home. Uh, people will also use other kind of odd materials. People use coffee beans for growing a couple uh, kinds of oyster mushrooms. They'll use the ground coffee, uh, the coffee grounds after it's been used to make coffee itself, the leftover waste grounds. Instead of throwing them in the compost pile or the trash, you can use them to uh, grow oyster mushrooms. Now, full disclaimer, I've tried this numerous occasions because I love coffee and I love mushrooms, and this would be the coolest thing ever, but all I grow is green mold. So there's some trick. It's a little bit trickier as far as home cultivation grows to get this one to work, but I do know people who have done it successfully, and it would certainly be a great way to grow mushrooms if you could get it to work. Uh, casings are um, a mixture of manure, Sawdust and soil is very popular for some species like these button mushrooms to grow on. This isn't so much accessible to home cultivators, but a lot of small commercial cultivators will use this method for some of the mushrooms that they like to grow. Uh, and also uh, cocoa coir, corn cobs, and get creative. There's all kinds of other waste materials that people can sometimes use for cultivating mushrooms. Just keep in mind that if you decide to experiment with some of these materials, there is a pretty high chance of failure as you try to figure it out. So just go into it with an open mind and don't expect it to work right away, but think of it as part of that exploratory process of learning how to utilize what you have to grow these fungi. You also want to think about pasteurization or sterilization of your substrate. Once you have that substrate, whatever it might be, straw, uh, sawdust, pellets, you need to pasteurize or sterilize it to make it a more uh, friendly habitat for your mushrooms. Because there's all kinds of other microbes that can be in that substrate, bacteria and other fungi that are going to compete with your mushrooms for the available real estate of that substrate. So you want to pasteurize or sterilize in some way to knock back some of those competitors and give your mushrooms the best possible start. I use cold pasteurization. This is uh, another word for a type of pH change, pasteurization that people will utilize. Uh, and this is the exact product that I use. It's this hydrated lime that you can buy at some uh, garden centers. And what it does is it significantly raises the pH of the substrate. It makes it more alkaline. Uh, and it helps shock those bacteria and fungi and kill off a lot of those competitors. Uh, so what I usually do at home is I take a big uh, clean trash can that I only use for mushroom cultivation and doesn't ever have trash in it and stuff it full of straw, measure a certain amount of this hydrated lime on top and add water and I'll soak the whole thing overnight. Um, you want to be careful with this in the summer because the temperatures are so high, you can start to get some funky stuff going on. But most of the time, just soaking it overnight will allow that pH to rise, uh, kill off some of those competitors, and the next day you can drain off that excess water and use that substrate for uh, pasteurizing or for, for growing your mushrooms. Uh, this works best with straw. It's very easy with straw. For other substrates like sawdust, this could be much more challenging because you know sawdust and water and it's going to float everywhere. But this is a really easy passive option for sterilizing your substrate for home cultivation, especially if you're using straw as a beginner option. This is really the, the best way to go about it. It's filling this big tub, adding that pH, that hydrated lime, and letting that shock occur to, to the substrate is really a straightforward and an easy thing for most people to do at home. The other primary way that people pasteurize substrate is through heat pasteurization. Uh, and this can be done with the method shown here. You have a really large drum and some kind of a heating system hooked up to that drum and you'll essentially boil the material. Uh, and this is a, a great method to use if you want to mess with setting up a system like this or you even have the ability to set up a system like this. Um, it's a little bit more finicky than what I really am working with right now, but people who are dealing with large volumes of substrate will sometimes use this method. Uh, you can also look at using a pressure cooker for heat pasteurization, and I have done this. It's, it's pretty straightforward as long as you are familiar with pressure cooker safety. Uh, using those 
pellets or sawdust, this is the best way to, to use a pressure cooker, is to have something like that, like pellets or sawdust in a container, either an open mason jar or these special plastic bags that are specifically designed to go in a pressure cooker for mushroom cultivation. And you can uh, sterilize the substrate that way using a pressure cooker. That's also an option. Just uh, be sure to be careful when using, using this piece of machinery. You also want to think about uh, the fungal culture that you're going to be using. This is the, the substance that you're going to buy from a reputable mushroom grower or source that you are going to use to grow your mushrooms at home. Uh, some of the most popular options are grain spawn that you can buy from, from mushroom growers that will be inoculated with the hyphae, the, um, the, the material of that mushroom so that you can grow it at home. Grain spawn is really popular for some fungi. A uh, sawdust spawn, especially for oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms is very commonly utilized. And you can see that white dusty coating all over it. That's the hyphae, that's the fungal body that is going to be inoculated into your substrate so that it can grow on your substrate and, uh, and make mushrooms for you. Uh, dowels, wooden dowels are very, very popular for shiitake cultivation. This is where they're being hammered into those logs. These little wooden dowels are a very easy method for that kind of cultivation, especially on a large scale. You can have a log drilled with all the holes for dowels and just hammer them in and have someone coming behind covering them up with, uh, with canning wax to seal them off from the environment. It's a very straightforward method, especially for rapid large scale cultivation. Some professional uh, mushroom growers, people who are doing this for commercial uses will use liquid cultures or pure cultures, but beware of this for small scale home cultivation. When you see people online trying to sell you things like pure cultures or liquid cultures, that should be a little bit of an alarm bell going off. A lot of reputable sources will do this as well, but they market them sort of specifically for large scale commercial cultivators. Uh, when you see people trying to sell stuff like this for home cultivation, you might want to approach it with just a little bit of caution because sometimes you're not, you can't be too sure what you're actually getting. Oh, receptacles, what are you going to put this substrate and this fungal culture in so you can grow your awesome mushrooms? Well, I love buckets, uh, five gallon buckets from Lowe's or Home Depot. These are food grade buckets that I drill holes in with a little power drill and stuff them full of that uh, straw that has been cold pasteurized and is full of that fungal culture to grow awesome oyster mushrooms. They'll grow right out of the holes in the bucket. It's super easy, straightforward, and I keep stacks of buckets under my porch uh, to grow mushrooms in. It's very easy um, and very user-friendly. In between growth cycles, once these mushrooms have quit growing, I'll just pull all the old straw out, scrub it out with a very light bleach solution, and it's ready to go for the next time that I want to use it. So for me, it's also very environmentally friendly because I'm not worried about putting a bunch of plastic or other materials into uh, the trash system instead of something that I can reuse like this bucket. Uh, but logs are also a really great option. You know, th these, this is a natural material. You don't need to worry about any plastic, any other kind of a receptacle. And this is a great option for shiitake and oyster mushroom cultivation or for some other species that we won't talk about specifically here today, but things like a herisium or hen or chicken of the woods grow really well on log systems like this. But again, this is more for larger scale cultivation or people who have access to their own wood lot. You can use buckets to grow them, like we talked about, really easy and straightforward. Uh, people use jars. This is very popular in some parts of Asia as a way to grow different species of fungi in commercial and home cultivation. These are little uh, enoki mushrooms, Flamulina villotypes, that are grown in the dark. That's why they're white like this. Uh, and they're grown in mass for large scale cultivation in some parts of Asia using these jars that are stuffed full of substrate. Grow bags are popular for commercial cultivators. You can see why this is a large volume of substrate in a bag that's hanging up kind of like a boxing bag. It's maximizing space and is possibly a kind of small temperature controlled book grow room to allow commercial cultivators to grow as many fungi as possible in as small a space as they possibly can. So uh, this is a, a popular option for people who are kind of scaling up their cultivation. Blocks are also really popular, both for, both for home cultivation and for commercial cultivation. 
And if you're getting into mushrooms for the first time and you want, might want to start growing your own, but you feel a little nervous to go through the whole process right off, you can buy pre-inoculated plots from reputable sources that are ready to go. And these are already inoculated. All you have to do is set them out on your counter, follow some very easy instructions, and these will grow mushrooms for you. And I really recommend this for people who have never grown mushrooms before, but are curious and learning more about the process. Uh, this is a really user-friendly way to experience mushroom cultivation for the first time without all the worry of contamination or other things going wrong. And you can also get really creative. Uh, I've seen mushrooms grown in some really unique containers, old coffee cans, uh, old two liter uh, soda, soda containers are a great option. I did this with some uh, high school students last year. They didn't have a lot of space. So we used these old two liter containers, stuffed them full of substrate and oyster mushroom spawn and used that to grow some really beautiful pink oyster mushrooms that the class just had a great time uh, viewing that growing process and watching that hyphae colonize the substrate. So this is a great option for small classroom projects or just if you want to play with this on a very small scale. Waste baskets have been utilized, old rubber containers. There's all kinds of, um, of containers that you can utilize for growing these mushrooms. If you can get a little bit creative about it, there's no end to what you can try. I've seen old onion bags, all kinds of stuff. And then location. Location is always important, right? And this is largely a consideration of how much space is available to you. Uh, do you have outdoor acreage? Do you have a wood lot? If so, log cultivation is a great option. But this isn't so friendly for people living in town or in smaller areas. Uh, garden beds are a great method for cultivation of some species that grow on wood chips like Stripharia, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, very user-friendly, beginner-friendly species. And this is one that we grow with some local garden groups downtown and youth groups where we seed the mulch around their fruit trees with Stripharia. And they got these awesome Stripharia mushrooms that grew out of the mulch right around their fruit trees in a very small space. They had uh, a lot of fun with it and it was cool to see. Uh, buckets are great for patio or small spaces. You can stack them so you're maximizing uh, that the space that you have available to you. This is what I do, buckets stack two or three high uh, to grow a good volume of oyster mushrooms in a very small grad student friendly space. Uh, low tunnels are popular for some species. This is a little bit more of that temperature control, environmental control without being completely uh, environmentally regulated. So still rather passive, but it provides you with a little bit of shelter from the beating sun. Uh, and this is popular for log cultivation and for cultivation of some other species. People use old um, storage sheds, old shipping containers. There is really no end to, to the kind of creativity you can see in mushroom cultivation. Uh, but this is one of the most popular options for new small scale growers is a little grow room like this uh, that you can sanitize, you know, hose down the walls and ceilings and clean really easily to grow mushrooms in an environmentally controlled condition. You also want to keep in mind temperature considerations. Mostly what I grow personally are oyster mushrooms, except for uh, also Stripharia. But with the oyster mushrooms, this changes for me with the seasons. I grow different strains, different varieties of oyster mushroom in the summer when the temperatures are really high than I do in the fall and winter when it's much colder. And so there are several reputable growers in the US of mushrooms who can provide you with chart information like this on the different strains of mushrooms that you might want to grow at different times of the year. And this is largely dependent upon fruiting temperature, that temperature range at which the mushroom is going to fruit the best. And uh, reputable growers will have this information well documented and easily available to you if you are curious to help you choose the right mushroom at the right time. And this information is available for both shiitakes and oysters from several different growers. Um, so a little bit about cultivation of three of the most popular species. Oyster mushrooms are the species that by far I recommend for beginner new cultivators. Uh, they're easy and versatile. They are tolerant of a wide range of conditions and they're pretty hardy. It takes a lot to kill an oyster mushroom. So they can stand up to contaminants, they can outcompete some of those other microbes, and they really are pretty happy with most conditions as long as you give them a ready food source and you keep them out of the blazing sun, they should do all right. Uh, there's a diversity of strains available like we talked about 
and a fairly low risk for failure. They're a great option for people who are just starting out and they taste delicious, which is always a plus. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's also stripharia or wine cap mushrooms is also what you might hear them called. This is another beginner friendly species. They grow really well on wood chips, on straw, and all you need to do is take the substrate that you'll buy from a reputable source and seed or inoculate that substrate with that, with that spawn in the fall or in the early spring. And the following fall or spring, so if you inoculate this coming spring, you wouldn't expect mushrooms until the following fall, but you should see a fruiting, a flush of those stripharia mushrooms. Now you can't go and spread this on mulch that's been sitting out in your yard for a year or more because there's already all kinds of other stuff living there. But if you've just put down, <coughs> I'm so sorry. If you've just put down fresh mulch uh, that is not dyed, isn't chemically treated, <coughs> this is a great option for, um, for stripharia cultivation. And finally, shiitake mushrooms. This is the second most commonly cultivated mushroom in North America. They're often cultivated on logs or on sawdust blocks uh, and being spring or winter fruiters. And they're not quite as beginner friendly as stripharia or oyster mushrooms, but if you have the space for log cultivation, there's a fairly low risk of failure with this species. They do a bit more poorly on sawdust blocks. It's a little bit more difficult to get them going. And sometimes all you get is green mold. Uh, but on logs, if you have the space, this is a very beginner friendly option. All right, that's all that we have today on mushroom cultivation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. And uh, please, you know, reach out if you have any questions.